The soul is the, the being that we are. And it's the capital B-E-I-N-G. The mm. being that we are. Our body fits inside our soul. Our soul is greater than anything. And when somebody says, I'm reading your aura, they're reading our soul, okay? They're reading our soul. Because our soul is huge. It, it expands way beyond us, way beyond us. And our soul is a collection of our knowledge that it has gained over the times we've been in some kind of physicalish form. And I said physicalish form. And it collects knowledge even when it's in its soul form. But there's something different about being in the human form. podcast. The opinions expressed on Broderlands podcast are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or Broderlands podcast. Natasha, thanks for coming on Broderlands podcast. It's an honor. Well, thank you for I you know, I was here when you first started and I'm so grateful to have this full story moment of coming back and doing this because I think it was last summer that you started, wasn't it? It was late August, I believe, and um you were the first person I asked to come on my podcast and I was really nervous. I was scared. I didn't know what I was doing. I was walking into the unknown, but you helped coach me and get past that, get past those fears. So I really appreciate it. Oh, God, Cause I know I can see you being such, Oh my gosh, you're, you're ready to explode energetically with what you are and who you are. And it's just, it's amazing to witness you through these, this year of watching you do your show and, I, you know, I've had, I've, you connected me with somebody who said, boy, you were one of the better persons that, that interviewed her. So, oh. um, you have skills, my dear, you got to trust them. Yeah. Thank you. I need to hear that too, because my mind tells me otherwise. And you know, it's hard because I, uh, I walked into this thing, not knowing how to do anything, not know how to use all this tech technology and editing and all that stuff but i slowly but surely i learned a little bit but by, by little by little yeah it was walking through fears and walking to the unknown and but just following my intuition at the same time so well congratulations you. and i always equate or uh, align my my new beginnings like getting a new phone mm. we miss the old phone why do we have to get a new phone and all crumb that whole story is there for us and then about a week into it, it's like, hey, I kind of like the new features. Hey, I know this stuff. I Hey, I'm, you know, and so um, with that, that, you know, it is about trusting and we're getting a whole bunch of new stories coming in to us that mm -hmm. we're, we're needing and wanting and the universe is wanting us to move forward. And, but it's our, our story that keeps us littler energetically mm -hmm. instead of that being us and you know we were talking before the show about some information and you know, it's yours to keep if you want it but i'm just i'm just wanting people to know that this is a, you know we're doing this and like today's show is actually on the solstice energy yes so and, and a full moon so endings with new beginnings you know and you know i know this show is going to be on for a long time so it's not anything dealing with this energy cuz but this is the time Anytime, anytime, anytime. It doesn't matter what the planets are saying or what's going on. Anytime is that time to get inside of us and say we can. Thank you. You know, before we get started, uh, maybe I'll have you um, share a little, about, a little bit about who you are and what you do for those who may have missed the first episode. Well, um, I'm Natasha Venter. I'm a lifetime, multi-lifetime intuitive. I work with past lives. I, Since I've been born, I've recognized that I have lived many, 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 many lifetimes. And they haven't been dream, they haven't been like meditations or anything. They've just been knowings. They've been on me since I've been alive. So walking through dimensions, walking through life has just been part of me since I was little. Um, and I remember being born. I remember sitting up in the hospital, you know, hospital corner, watching my mom, a doctor and a nurse. It was early in the morning. So men weren't allowed in that, the hospital rooms at that time. My dad actually said he was asleep at home. Um, and all of a sudden I was inside my mom and popping out and seeing the doctor. 
And so I have a lot of memories of being in a, a baby, even, you know, where, you know, my head pops up and I see my mom smiling at me, you know, so my soul has been alive many, many times. And so you know, people have really been talking about their near death experiences. I think I had one when I was born. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, right. I really think I've had one because I remember writing my contract coming in, you know, about how, you know, it's like, well, I'm not going to be poisoned this lifetime. So anything that's like da, 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 you know, like smoothies or anything that smells like medicine-y or anything that is off, you know, that um, I'm not eating it. I'm not drinking it. I, it's not going down my throat. And so money in my life, much of my lifetime is pro processing what goes down my throat which is actually you know how do i speak my truth because i've been killed for still speaking my truth in many lifetimes so you know this is my lifetime to really have a voice for people and and helping people to find their voice yeah thank you and you know what you just said right now people probably were like what what is she talking about would you expand on that pre-birth memory remembrance that you've had because i think it's profound well, thank you. Um, yes, and and I love organic questions. I I am one. My my intuitiveness comes out when we have discussions, and so I love that. Um, so my pre birth memory, and I have an understanding that souls go through this. You'll talk to anybody who has a pre birth memory that there is like this big book, <laughs> per se. <laughs> you know, and it's metaphorically or if it, it, it's for real. I mean, it's what whatever the image is. Some people have different kind of images, but this big book of, you know, and, and it was like, almost like, you know, because I understand time right now is, is elusive. People talk about past lives, but actually the life we're in is the one that's important. And so as the book was open, it was open in the middle because I haven't, I'm not done living my lifetimes, wow. whatever they are consistent of. And, and yet there's this story of who I am. And so that when we when we're coming in, when the soul is ready to come into this life, that we we're standing at kind of like a a pedestal or a doorway, uh, and we write in what is our intentions for this lifetime. Some people have contracts that they need to work on. Some people have stories that they need to work on, but there is that intention of what are we? What are we supposed to kind of intentionally be in this lifetime? Mm. And then, um, and then we can have some do's and don'ts. I don't want to do this. Well, I don't want to do that. But the thing is though, like for me, I don't want to be poisoned. So I had to discern out what was a healthy thing for me to eat and not to, to. so like for me drinking alcohol, I had a little bit of a drink and I got the room spinning both ways at the same time. You know, I don't, I wasn't meant to do things that weren't right for my body because my body was going to have to be at a higher frequency because of the work that I do and, and who I talk with and who I negotiate with. So going in that we have this contract book that we can put up what we want. The thing is though, when we get into this life and people say, well, I wrote a contract that I wanted to have a nice life. But we forget that once we get into this lifetime, that we have to deal with the human aspect. And that hum human aspect is, is that, oh, I want to be with my same soul family. But wait a minute, my soul family, the one that's going to be my father, maybe had abuse when he was younger and is angry and an alcoholic this lifetime. So what am I supposed to learn from that? Because I wanted to come in this lifetime and figure out that I was um i was a miracle you know if if that person wanted to become a miracle in this lifetime but the story is that they had to work through the story of their family the story of the parent the story of the of the drama trauma that was in their life to become the 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 moment where, that they realized i'm a miracle in spite of what my reality is around me so we sometimes we go into this life and we have these stories to figure out how to negotiate who we are in spite of it, in spite of it. And I've had a lot of mantras that have come to me that end in in spite of it. 
Can I ask you a question on something you just you brought up earlier uh, to oh, give please, people I love better, questions. <laughs> to give people a better <laughs> understanding on a so family you mentioned and so contract. Maybe you can help broaden our lens on that and what that means to you. Um well soul family. I always picture like soul families like rings of a tree. And you can tell by if you cut a tree in half, you can tell how old a tree is by the rings of the tree going out, right? Well, a soul family can be anywhere on that tree. Well, my dad and I, we were like two peas in a pod. We finished each other's sentences. We were in the center of the tree. We were really tight soul family. But like if you have like a um, a coworker that feels familiar but isn't really familiar, they might be further out on the rings of the tree. Mm. And then what happens is, is that we have these people that, that soul families that go from lifetime to lifetime. Like my dad has been my kid. My mom has been my grandmother. You know, my, you know, my cousin has been my sister. You know, it's like, we have these soul families. Um, I've been a father. I've been a mother. Uh, you know, all these different soul families can play different roles you know, sometimes your soul family can be your boss that you're really close with. Some soul families can be the, the, um, the coworker that became, or the police officer that became your dad because your dad didn't stick around, you know, so it, it your soul family doesn't have to be blood, hmm. but they can come into your life and be a part of you. And that's what a soul family and the, and people go into like the twin flame and stuff like that. Well, that's all in that soul family story. But how it plays out in our humanness is not always a straight line and and a um, a calm gentleness because sometimes our greatest teachers are our soul family, mm. and sometimes it's not always in the niceties because sometimes we have to learn things. Like my husband is is one of my soul family, and he's my greatest naysayer, but my naysayer is the one that's supposed to keep me on my track. So it's empowering me instead of diminishing me. But it took me a couple of years to figure that out. Not to let his story create mine. And I love my man. He is, he is becoming this amazing man. He is, you know, he's now 12 years sober. You know, he's, he's becoming this terrific man. But there again is his soul journey, right? Becoming in my soul family. And we are working through our soul contract stretching and fully learning from each other, doing our dance. And what a blessing that is. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so the uh, so what is a soul contract? A soul contract is is that we have these inten intentions that we're going to work on something in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. Now, for me, my soul contract is for me to find my voice in spite of my realities. To be the love that I am for this world in spite of the realities around me. I am meant to shine light in spite of all the lifetimes that have dim, tried to dim me. So how does that play out is, is that my sole contract was to gain that story. But what it did was it put hurdles in front of me this lifetime so that I can practice to shine my light in spite of the realities around me. Because that is the sole walking is to become our greater self but the teachings of our world around us the drama traumas the people that scream and yell at us whoever that is are the practice for us to become our greater selves but we give it too much credit we give it too much power we give it too much we get we hear people's other truths more than we hear our own and that soul contract is part of that journey of trying to figure it out. Now, I'm not going to say that people who have been in um, trial, child trafficking or have been, you know, that's an interesting dance. And we have to remember, though, that there was this human aspect that we did not put in our soul contract to work on. And, and. You know, I, I cannot speak of, of individual soul contracts in this moment, but I can t give a general broad look at it. And, you know, we have a soul contract to, to be who we are, but the realities of the human world around us sometimes put more, they, they weigh more negative, they, they put more 
like someone who um who is uh you know growing up in a house where a parent doesn't give them food and shuts them in a closet well what is my song song contract somebody can ask but that's finding out who we are in spite of the realities around us and my love goes to everyone that has this hellish life but we have to remember that sometimes our soul contract did not think of the human aspect when we came into this world and i'm sorry that people have had to go through that yeah thank you for touching on that and helping us understand a little bit more um i'm gonna ask you two questions um that i'd love you to expand on um what is the soul and its purpose and um you obviously b believe in reincarnation maybe mm -hmm. you can help <laughs> expand on on both if you don't mind the soul is the the being that we are and it's the capital b-e-i-n-g the mm -hmm. being that we are our body fits inside our soul our soul is greater than anything and when somebody says i'm reading your aura they're reading our soul okay they're reading our soul because our soul is huge it, it expands way beyond us way beyond us and our soul is a collection of our knowledge that it has gained over the times we've been in some kind of physicalish form and i said physicalish form and it collects knowledge even when it's in its soul form but there's something different about being in the human form. We we learn from, you know, the tug and pull of our <laughs> existence. You know, like when I was dealing with a um a uh, rose bush earlier today, you know, that it was like, ow, that hurts being poked into my skin, right? Well, I learned that wait a minute, this rose bush, I'm moving it from its comfort zone, so it's going to reach out and grab me. So I'm going to say, "Please be gentle with me." I'm just trying to support you so you're not hanging over. So then it didn't stick on me as much because I forgot to ask permission. So going into this, that our soul is the light. Our soul is the being around us so that we can be our greater self. It's the collection. It's the knowing. Our higher self is the brain, is what I get, of our soul. Mm. So then it is the computer, it's the knowledge of our soul. Even though our soul has knowings too, just like our body has knowings that our mind doesn't have. So going into that, and then, and then our body is the skeleton of our soul. And the spirit is what I get is the energy. It's the energy that's around us. It's our muses. It's the, it's the when you open up the doors for the first time after winter, and you let the doors open, you let the sunshine in, you, you, you let things in. That is the spirit of life. It's the chi. It's the, it's the, it's the moment. And so our soul is, is something that came from, I remember I looked at where my soul came from and it came from the greater. It's the greater light. It's the greater love. It's the collector. It's the, it's the knower. It's the beer. It's the, it's the universe. And they took me from that universe and became my soul. And then my soul had the journey of where it was going to go. And I said sometimes we, we're not all fully in body. It's because some star beings are not body form. They are energy, but yet they are a little bit more denser energy than soul energy. Just like an angel is a little bit denser energy than total pure soul energy. If that makes any sense. Makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what's the purpose of reincarnation in your opinion? It's the journey of our soul. No more, no less. It's the journey of our soul. It's to collect. It's to, it's to know. It's to experience. It's to be. It's to, to um, support the generations of, you know, part of this is, is that we are the kind of the workers of the earth. Mm. You know? In order for this universe to keep running, it needs physicality. Anything in spirit, anything in the universe, and this is something I didn't, wasn't even thinking about until you asked that question. 
but that's where my intuitive works. It just kind of comes in. But it's like we need the physical because a planet is energy. It's it's all it's an, it's a it's a physicality, right? The moon, the sun is a physicality. Whatever it is made of. Now that's the question. Whatever it's made of is a is a physical form. So you go to other universes. And they're still physical, but we need sometimes the physical aspect to keep the physical workings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that yeah. it's a bigger picture than what I'm trying to say, but yet it's not a simple answer. Yeah, it's a broad topic, so definitely. It's a huge it. broad topic. It. <laughs> <laughs> that was the simplest way I can say it in this moment. So it's just basically to gain knowledge. It's great. It's to help the universe be what it's meant to be. It's a journey. It's a journey. We have a journey on this body. And then we have a journey in the soul. And we have a journey. It's it's a journey on top of the journey on top of the journey. How does past life trauma affect our present lifetime? It can be huge in a quiet way. In a quiet way. Like um, one of my past lives or other life, because it's not really, it's really all past life. But one of my lifetimes that I have been was that I was a seer of a town. And people would come to me in the cave where I lived with other seers. And we were honored. We were given food. We were shown that we, we would give them medicine. We would help them be healthy. We would, you know, we would be the medicine people of the, of the and we Mystic. had like three of mystics we were we there was like three or four of us and I, i've got a friend that is one of i got a couple friends actually now that i know that were in the cave with me mm. but when we came out of the cave food was thrown at me rocks were thrown at me and i was so shamed by being who i was even though i tried to stand up tall and you, you know, know where my I, where are my clothes because i was beautiful in that lifetime you know wear who i am but that's how I died, was being stoned. Wow. Somebody hit me just right in the head for being who I was. So those lifetimes of that trauma, like when I was born in this lifetime, I was very shy, quiet. I, you, you wouldn't recognize me as I was back then. I thought I was ugly. I thought I was all these different things when I was younger because that lifetime shadowed me. Oh, I can't say anything because somebody's going to hurt me. Somebody's going to bully me. And actually, I was bullied. I was actually bullied and I was actually deemed bad and, and you know, all these different things because I was not, I was living the life of my belief outside of me. Until one day, I had the mantra that came to me. How I perceive myself is how others perceive me. Because our, how we believe ourselves is how other people are going to treat us, right? So how I perceive myself is how others are going to perceive me. And that is the beginning of me saying to my other lifetimes, I'm done being the story of other people's beliefs. It is time for me to speak the truth of the universe, which is self-love and love for others. And that is my, my, my calling is to help others go through that and do and maneuver and, and work through our 3D world <laughs> and the realities around us to get to be our shining light. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe you can walk us into your upbringing. I know you have an interesting uh, childhood. I, I, I think you were the only child around for a period of time. That must have been weird. Did yeah. you have any... Did you have any imaginary friends or did you see any other spirits? Were, were you like, how, how does it look like in your mind being a, a psychic medium? Well, when I was growing up, I had spirits in the house all the time. All, I heard, I mean, there was noise constantly in my house. I hated going down and going to the bathroom in the middle of the night because it was so loud. It was so like, it was like swimming through spirit. And then I had, used to have a spirit that would walk from another bedroom, walk around and go like this and peer around the corner to, to, now I know as an adult, to see if I was okay. But it scared the bejeebies at me. <laughs> I don't know how many Our Fathers and, and um, 
and um my and um uh you know Hail Marys Hail Marys <laughs> <laughs> that I said as I had stuffed animals all around me. Yes, I was an only child. My mom had a hysterectomy when she was like twenty one, so I I was meant to be I was meant to be me. And so with that, that, you know, being intuitive my whole life, my dad was intuitive. I came from a very intuitive family, but my cousins even said, Natasha, when you spoke when you were younger, which you didn't speak very much, we listened because there was something you were saying that was important for us to hear. So I was meant to be, I don't want to say the word bigger, but, but more out in the world than other people in my family. Didn't know that, but now I do. Because the universe kind of laid me on that path to do that. But, you know, raising up as an only child, I, my dad came from a family of, of um, seven siblings. He was a chiropractor, so I learned about energy real early. You know, muscle testing, the body has energy. He always said that I'm here to help the computer of the body to do better. So his goal was always to help the computer of the body to maneuver its better self. So I always learned that there was something that could be, you know, like any computer, you can, you can, you can help it. You can fix it. You can shift it up. You can inspire it. So I always understood that the, that, you know, we can shift up our body if we believe we can. And so Thanks. going into this, you know, that, and then as I went, you know, I, you know, I um, ended up, um, marrying a man and, and, you know, just learning life's generalities. And then when um, my parents were passing away, I was having kids at the same time. And, um, and so the world was teaching me about grief. And that's one thing I love to support people. I have a calling and it's not like I love people to be in grief. It's not that, but, but it's my calling to help people go through what is the story of grief. Because the universe helped me through mine. And now I'm here doing what I'm doing. <laughs> Being my, you know, my counselor self. Yeah, does that answer you. your question? I love that. And uh, you, you help a lot of people going through grief. What does that look like? A lot of people do not understand that grief is a journey and it's a never ending journey. Mm. But there's a part when it first happens that it's unwalkable sometimes. It's undoable you cannot it, it it makes you stop it makes you literally stop and it takes your legs out from underneath you it, it turns you inside out upside down and you do not know who you are and it depends on how the grief hits because mm. grief can be as you know losing someone in a car wreck or you know you can't go to the grocery store when you wanted to go to the grocery store so grief has many different can go from one end to the other end of the spectrum but grief is grief and people who are in grief of losing somebody can get triggered in grief because they couldn't go to the grocery store and they wonder why they bawl and they they're so hatred and they're just like so angry that they couldn't go to the grocery store at that certain time because the trigger of the other grief laid on other parts of the grief. So if that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense for me. Thank so you. going into this, that people forget that that grief is such an inner weavings and, and people, a lot of people don't understand that when they're in grief, anger, anger and hatred and disappointment and, and just, you have no words for what emotion you're in. It's such a key point of it, of, of grief. And we have to let these emotions out. There's many times where in my, in my story of grief that I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden I feel it just coming over like a, uh, like a, it's almost like a blob that kind of comes over you. Right. And, and you're driving down the road and you're like, God, get, I just got to see, I got to see, I got to see. And then I, you know, I stop at a light and I go, okay, just let me get grief. And I tell it like a personality, like a being, you know, not an entity necessarily, but a, an energy of grief. I talk to it like a, like a, like a friend sitting next to me and I tell it, you gotta wait a minute, let me be safe. And so I get to a parking lot and I just, and that's even, let's see, my kid is 
how old is my kid? 32 years old. So 32 years ago is my, my dad passed away. And I still sometimes cry like it was yesterday because that's grief. But I can tell you the grief of today, 32 years old, is different than it was when it first happened because it became the walkable. I call it a walkable grief, that you know that on the other side of this emotion, you're going to be able to get through it. But when you're in the unwalkable part, you feel like you can't get through it. You can't, you don't see in journey. It's almost like a horse with blinders on. You don't know the world around you. I tell people who are in grief, please, please, please write things down. Write down even, put on your phone a reminder, I need to eat. You know, have an alarm so you remember to eat. You know, have these things that, that, get, that can help you because this is a time when adrenals get hammered. This is when kidneys get hammered. This is when your liver and your gallbladder get hammered, you know, because we're in a disbelief moment. And, you know, and love for ourselves is like, <laughs> it's out the door because we're so much into what's happening around us or not happening around us. Yeah, thank you. You know, I just had a childhood friend a couple of weeks ago that got murdered. He was shot to death. And um, I'm so sorry. I, oh, no, thank you. Uh, what, what kind of advice would you give someone that is grieving from a, a death of a loved one? Especially when, it, when you weren't ready for it. Give yourself time. Give yourself time. You would tell people, I'm having a, a, a moment right now and I need some time. Thank you. Uh, and, and also to remembering that, that emotions are going to pop up. Kind of like an upset stomach when you eat something that's wrong for your body. So you never know when they're going to pop up. So when they do, excuse yourself for a moment and honor those emotions because they are part of the dance. And um, hug yourself if you can, when you can, and know that you're going to be perfectly imperfect as you go through this journey. So you may not be all straight in, in your head. You, you may forget things. You may not realize that life is, and we have expectations for ourselves during this time, and we got to actually put those expectations on the back burner and tell people around us, be honest with people. Hey, I just went through a life-altering experience and I need some time. I need time because grief is a life-altering experience and we need to give ourselves time. And I, I love this with you because that's not, that's not easy. That's not easy. Appreciate it. You know, you know, what's interesting is to the core of my being, I know there's no such thing as death, yet the beautiful part about being a human being is to grieve and to love someone and have a connection with and appreciation to have a connection and a friendship through, through this experience. So it's very interesting to, to, to look at the human condition and the human experience. Exactly, because grief is an emotion that it incorporates Love, anger, frustration, happiness, extreme. You can be mad at one moment and crying and tearful at the next. I mean, it's about extremes, but grief actually is one of the greatest teachers to find ourselves. Mm. So the more that we can go into those emotions, be vulnerable with ourselves and be ourselves, it is an amazing teacher of who we are. And that is why we're on this earth. There's only a few other planets in the solar systems around that actually has this experience that we have on this earth with these emotions and grief is the one that goes are you there <laughs> you're gonna make it but it's gonna be a journey and and it's about loving ourselves through it but we got to remember it's a life-altering experience and sometimes it's hell at first especially for those people who lose children and it's not something that, you know, like the, the grief of that parent that is losing, but just lost that child. I mean, we're friends, but yet at the same time, though, that parent, I mean, love goes to this world for trauma dramas. And I mean that with honesty. You know, there is trauma and there is drama. It is. And my love goes to everyone that goes through that. 
you know, we talked the other day and we're talking, we started talking about a topic that I love to bring up nowadays is uh, entity attachments. Maybe you can help us expand on what that is and what that means. So entity attachments, there is, I, I want to say there's two categories of attachments. And then there's kind of that gray area in the middle. So one attachment is kind of simpler to explain. And that's the entities of Jin and and the the you know the dark beings of this world, you know the um, and I don't want to say Jin, but and there could be like skinwalkers. There can be there can be a lot of different stories. What attachments can be, you know, past people who have been beings. Like um, I helped to clear a house of a collector. He was um, actually the man of the town, and he was not a happy man. And so when he died, he actually became the collector because he collected things in his lifetime, and he was a power, and he knew that now he had different power, and so he was a soul collector. And so working through getting him out of that house, getting because he was tethered in the house, that so we had to detether him so that the universe could work with him. So he was an entity. So that is one side of it kind of easier to explain you can get rid of those you can maneuver them you can do whatever you need to do depends on who you know what to do okay some homes have attachments of those kinds of beings like someone who passed away before you know a, a darker entity that was um like if somebody was murdered in the basement and then there was a house built on top of it you know that energy might be there of that drama, that pain, that 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 being who now is the murderer who was murdered, you know, came back and, and sitting in that house, right? So there's energies and there's entities that can be in those places. Then we have the other kind of grayer area. I also understand that like from for um for witnessing people in life that there could be the the um like addiction entity the alcoholic entity the um and if somebody is in anger a lot there can be the anger entity so emotions if we're stuck in emotions it can create an energy that is thicker more denser and it can attach our attach itself to some to us because we're in that mode that mode of operation long time so it becomes a buddy of ours it can becomes a partner of ours so sometimes when we're wanting to be less angry or less addicted to something we have to work with the energy of who we've been and what we've been doing so in in order to stay alive or strengthen itself, this energy, it has to continue to keep us in anger, to keep us in the addiction. Would you would you say or no? I wouldn't say that it's it's like um let me talk to it for a second. Um as as I was hearing from anger that it is is what it is. If you're angry, you feed me. You are my energy. You are something that I know, and I know you, and you know me. So we're a cobiotic relationship. So when we start saying, I'm done with being that angry, then what happens is that we stop feeding it. And mm -hmm. it may at first start saying, but, 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 but you're, you're making me hungry, right? You're, you're making me hungry because you're not angry as much as you used to be. But as we start changing, then that energy starts becoming smaller and less important, less manipulative, less less storytelling, because it likes to sit on a corner of ours and go, hey, remember, you used to get angry at this time. Well, let's get angry at this time. You know, it's that kind of that whisper in the ear. It's the devil on the shoulder type of thing. But, but what it is, is that when we stop giving it so much energy, then it starts being such an important part of us like there is um there's sometimes when i'm doing a session with somebody and shame is in front of them and and shame is something that that rules the roost right 
And like, you can't see me right now because shame's sitting in front of me. So if I'm going to do something, then I have to look around shame to say, oh, wait a minute. No, I can't do that. You know, I'm, I can't do that. But if you tell shame to sit on the side and say, guess what? Thank you for being my helper. Thank you for being my teller. Thank you for supporting me because I know that shame actually got me through an abusive parent situation. It kept me little so I didn't get seen. But then that shame is also my parents' story. So I need to actually give back some of that energy of that shame to not necessarily give it to the parent, but lay it at the feet of the situation. So then shame starts saying, oh, thank you. Because we all have shame. We all have anger. We all have emotions. We're meant to have everything. But we give it too much power. And then it creates a story. And then it creates a strength. So if we could ask things to go to the side, I'd be more of our witness. Thank you for what you've done. I honor you for what you've done. But now it's time for us to be in union of our story. I treat it. I treat emotions and situations like my buddy, my friend, put my armor on. Thank you. You did a great job. You did a wonderful job. But it's time for you to stop. Like there's a lot of people with anxiety right now. And anxiety is like this. Can't do it. Nope. I'm going to be anxious. Nope. There's a situation. There, and our nervous system is attached to that, that anxiety. And I want to honor people with anxiety. I have anxiety. But what I do is I say, who's in control of who? Who's in control of who? So anxiety, I know we're having a moment right now. This is a teller. This is where we've been sabotaged before. But you know what? I'm different now, aren't we? I'm different now, aren't we? We got it. We got it. Nervous system, we got it. I'm going to trust the process. I'm going to trust it. Who's in control of who? Many times we have these emotions, these entities that are in, in charge of us. Now we can also have the entity of, of um, somebody else, like the energy of like um, a parent that was, was, you know, we have a lot of parents that are um, what the word is now narcissist, or we have a lot of, a lot of people who are, uh, parents who are abusive or you know, or um, schizophrenic or whatever those stories are. And we can have the entity of a parent that rides with us and whispers in our ears and takes control of situations. When we can tell our parent, sit down, sit down, you're in no longer in charge of my life. Thank you for all the tellings and all the teachings you did so I can be me, but sit down. So entities can be just as much emotions and story as it is anything else. And we can create it bigger than it really is, but we forget. So what I want people to understand is when you are in a story more than you should be. Like I picture like, um, like emotions are like a wheel, a bicycle wheel. And if you've ridden bicycles, you know that sometimes that the spoke can go through the tire sometimes, and then it gets stuck and the wheel can't move because emotions are meant to move. So when they get stuck, we got to make sure, oh, do I have something that's starting to build? That emotion is sticking around longer than it should. Anger is sticking around. We should be angry, but it should move through. We should have disappointment, but it should move through. We should have shame, but it should move through. We should have, t you know, these emotions, this extreme happiness. It should move through. Joy. It should be with us, yet let other emotions come through too. So when we're stuck in one blinder moment for too long, depression. Ooh, depression is huge. Depression is supposed to move through. But people are stuck in depression. Because the, the wheel didn't move. And then what do you have? You have the entity of depression with you. And then we get on the, a lot of the, um, oh, man, not going to go there with the drugs and stuff like that. But a lot of these drugs are, that we take are meant to be short-lived to help us to get through that emotion. But we got to do the other spiritual work. We got to do the other stuff. 
talk to depression, work with depression, deal with your body, you know, take your D's, take your B's, take your magnesium, take, take these other things to help you eat the right foods, you know, stop drinking the energy drinks, stop drinking, you know, eating all the sugar, stop doing these things that causes depression too with the body. It's a fuller picture so we can get that emotion moving through so that we don't have the entity of depression. That makes any sense? Well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I was just thinking about what kind of uh, practices or tips would you give someone to actually draw awareness on some of these emotions they may be unconscious of on a daily basis and they're constantly in stress? And what kind of um, advice can you give us to help reduce these emotions? Okay. We can never reduce emotions. They are what they are. They're meant to be here. We are meant to have extreme anger, but who is controlling who? I had a moment today where I had anger that was, ooh, you know, I wanted to blurt. Mm. But, I, but I knew that my intention was not to cause more harm. My intention was not to cause more harm. And so I tapped down anger, and anger gave me the words to use but not the emotion to throw at somebody else. So that is practice. I've been practicing a lot of years, practicing a lot of years. And that's the thing is, is that we need to start practicing being aware of our emotion. Practice noticing who we are. When somebody talks to me, am I triggered? Oh, I'm triggered. Yes, I'm triggered. Okay, I'm triggered. Why am I triggered? Start asking why. Start asking being observant of yourself without shame, without guilt, without pain. You know, sometimes we go, oh, wait a minute. Two days ago, I said so-and-so to this person, and I just noticed it. Great, you noticed it. Great, you noticed it. And then later, about six months later, you probably noticed that you're noticing it on the same day. So start noticing what you are reacting to instead of interacting. Take your foot off your gas pedal of your life and start being noticing of observations. So it's a lot of practice, and this is more of a session than just the five-minute conversation on it, on your show, but you know, because every individual is different and how they would how they in their emotions, their story, say something. Kind of like with, um, with uh, my husband is a double Leo and I'm a double Cancerian. So I have a lot of water signs in my, in my planet. So for me, when I, when I get yelled at or talked to, my crab wants to go, right? But, but it's that, that part of me that says my crab can stand up and say, hey, I don't need to nip at you. So some people are like the, um, like the, the Aries, the ram, the bull. So instead of ramming into their life, they can maybe sit back and just go, huh, I like to leap around on the, on the, on the mountainside and be who I need to be and then honor the people that are around me. So there's different ways of negotiating it. You know, we all have different parts of us. We all have, you know, like Geminis, they love to think. Us water signs are emotional. Fire signs are more fiery about themselves. So how do you, in your individuality, start practicing witnessing who you are when something happens without any judgment? And then how can you interact with it later? differently. Check in. I would say check in with what's your intention. Are you intending to get back at someone? Or are you intending to stop this action of fights all the time? And how are you going to do that? Because we are emotional beings. We are meant to be emotional beings. But we're meant to be emotional beings with knowledge. And we not everybody has been taught to do that. Now, I'm going to say I have um, the God of War, which is Mars, in Cancer. So I hug a lot of people through the fiery moments and the warish moments. But that's me. 
where somebody else may have more of God in, you know, the fire sign. So they're going to be more fiery about it. So figuring out how to discern your life. Look at the word discernment. Figure out how you can discern your life. Who's in control? Is it your emotions? Is it reaction? Or is it somebody else's story about you? Ooh, somebody else's story about you. Does that have more power over me? No. So start looking at the patterns. If you need to, write things down. I was triggered today. I was triggered today. I was triggered today. And you'll start noticing that there's a pattern. If that's the type of person you are. So there's different ways of negotiating this. Like I said, it's a private session with, you know, <laughs> with, um, with understanding that, that we all have a story and we all have something that we've been made up to. But we really need to discern out who's really talking. Is it reaction or interaction? I have really practiced. I, I sat down and practiced for almost a year how to interact with my life instead of reacting to my life. And that really helped me to just to witness what is truly happening. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's before we go, I want to ask you a couple more questions. One of them I would love to talk to you about is um, I was talking to a friend the other day and never heard of the term spirit guides. Do you believe we all have spirit guides? And it, oh, can you geez. expand on that? <laughs> and how do we utilize them on a daily basis? Everyone has spirit guides. It doesn't matter what you believe in. Now, there's some spirit guides that will be more your belief system than not your belief system. And they will cloak themselves in a positive way for you. So, like, if you're, um, let's say, in the um, religion of um, Catholic, or, you know, Catholic or, or, you know, Christian religion, then Jesus might look different to, to, to them than somebody who's Muslim. Because that's what they know. Mother Mary will look different to someone who who they are she'll cloak her so like if you if like um if uh if mother mary is talking to someone who it believes in like um the christian religion she'll look a certain way if she's talking to someone who of, of the first nations the the native americans they'll she'll be white calf buffalo woman mm. so we all have spirit guides we are never alone we all have angels we have some angels that are with us from birth to death of our body and then help us transition on. We have the spirit guides that are um, like I have um, uh, I have a um, guide who is um, St. Francis and. You know, and then I have this guide, Roger Dodger. That's what he wanted to be called. He is a um, he was a World War Two air pilot, World War One air pilot. And he, um, he knows a lot about technology. So when I get the idea of something, he helps me a lot with my technology situations. He gives me ideas. So guides will pop in ideas. Like you said that your intuition, when you were getting, beginning this show, right? You had the intuition of trusting. Those are your muses. Muses help us with our creativity. Our guides will help us with insights. Question. Oh, I didn't think of that, doing that. I'm not Googling that instead of calling um, customer service. Well, Google that. There's the answer out there nowadays. Where we used to have to ask for customer service, now we can Google what we need to do. And then discern what is truth. Discern out what is truth. And that's one thing that I say with most of my sessions and my show that I do. No, but your truth is your truth. I'm just a perception to help you do better in your life if you choose. So put this information in your back pocket, carry it around and see what you can make of it your own. Because we all have our own truths that we need to live by. Spirit guides help us do that walk of our lives. And those spirit guides sometimes will help us. We'll, like all of a sudden we'll get, remember, you be careful of that knife. You'll hear that. You almost hear, be careful. It's like, oh, thank you. That's your spirit guide. That might be your higher self, too. That might be your higher self answering that or making that say. It might be your soul talking to you. So our guides are anything and everything that help us go through this lifetime of ours. They can come and go with situations. 
like when you were doing, we were beginning this, um, this podcast, you had a guide that came in to help you with this pod, this situation. Now it may not, it, it may be leaving and now a new guide coming in because you're now going to level up with this podcast. But it's up to you in the human form if you're going to follow through with that leveling up. And it's trusting the process, right? So our guides help us, but they cannot make us do things that we don't want to do. Or we feel like we're not able to accomplish what we're doing. You know, one of the names of my guides is, is Jack Tripper. Because he'd be mm-hmm. tripping. No, I'm just playing, <laughs> I'm just playing around. No, no I, but, I, but you can. And, and that's the thing is they're not stuck on names. Yeah, so if someone's listening and they're like spirit guys, how do I even tap into the spirit guys? Is that the devil? Is that, you know, you know our conditioning through religion and just our upbringing. Like, how do we really genuinely tap into our spirit guys? Is there any exercises or prayers that you use? There again, this coming down to not being reactionary in our life. So then when we're, when we're interactive, we're we're starting to breathe more. We're starting to slow down. You know, I get a lot of information for when I sit in my car and just breathe for a minute. Mm. You know, that before I grab onto a handle to walk through a door, I breathe for a minute. And that gives our our, our spirit guides our time with us. And be willing to trust an insight that you're getting. Like if you're baking cookies. And you're going, gosh, what did grandma put in those? And all of a sudden you get the idea, cinnamon. Trust that that you got that information. That's the difference. Our spirit guides want to talk to us, but sometimes we don't trust that information. So we don't do it. And then they're like, okay. I mean, they always want to help us. But the more that we interact with them, the more that they're willing to interact with us. And then it's kind of like a um, moments. It's like like that feeling like, oh, I should drive around that corner again. And then all of a sudden there's somebody pulling out of a parking lot, a parking space, because you listen to that, oh, I should drive around the corner again. That insight, that ah moment. And it's not, sometimes it's just as quiet as, as, oh, yeah, I should drive around the corner again, shouldn't I? So spirit guides will interact with us in many different ways. They'll also put like birds, animals in front of us. You know, uh, it will be, um, you know, like I had a little black insect, insect that, uh, that critter that got in my hair when I was weeding earlier this morning. And I took it out of the sink and I bought, but it was like a hard shelled, you know, little thing. And I'm like going, okay, so the message is, darkness be willing to walk through my darkness which is a personality which is a story right that i can't do it worth walk through our darkness and do the little things because the little things make a difference in the big picture of the world and it was in my hair so what did i do that's part of my thinking right so what is my thinking about about remembering to get into the little details that make the big picture. Returning an email, doing a story, um, whatever it may be. I love how you started off with going back to your breathing because breath means spirit. It um, does. I, when I wake up in the morning and when I go to bed at night, I breathe and I just, I'm quiet for a moment. I stop and I'm quiet for a moment. I, I, I'm honestly not the greatest meditator, but I do a lot of walking meditation. Like if I walk around the yard, I'm available. I'm, I'm seeing how the grass feels on my feet. I'm noticing what the, the, the wind is going through the trees. I'm noticing what birds are flying. Because and the insects, birds, cats, dogs will be our messengers. Numbers is another way that our universe talks to us billboards, things on cars. Like I was driving down the road and here comes a bison truck, you know, in front of me. And it's like, okay, walk in the life like a bison. Bisons, the the buffalo, they walk into a storm. 
they walk into a storm. A cow will sit there and huddle down and they'll walk away from the storm. But a bison will walk into the storm because it knows that the storm will pass over it. But it's got tough skin. It's, it's bullish. It's strong. It's, I can do it. Because it knows that also on the other side of the storm is greener grass. So be willing to walk through the storm. So bison, you messages come from our universe all over the place, but it's us being aware and observant enough to see it. And when we see more and more numbers, when, we, when we're doing that, that shows that we are paying attention and the universe knows that we're going to listen that way. So if we start noticing numbers, then it says, oh, that's when they're listening to us. So we're going to throw more numbers in her way. So she starts noticing. So guides and angels and whoever is your, gu- your supporting team will support you in that journey. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Um, what's your conception of God, if you don't mind me asking? I know it's a broad topic and a hard question. A knowing of God, as it is so called, is everything that is around us. The up, down, in and out. But the love that I know that we would call God is the rainbow after the storm or through the storm. It's the rainbow. It's the it's the sunlight that comes through the clouds. You know when you when you're looking at some dark clouds and all of a sudden there's that ray of sun coming down. It's the it's the dog that looks at you with those warm eyes after a long day. It's the raindrop on the tip of a a leaf. It's a butterfly that flies by you. So the, the one that I know of love has some tough love in it. A teach greatest teacher, but will always have its hand out to support us through our journey if we're willing to look. Thank you. Um, what what I love what you just said right now, I remember, you know, um, you talked about your husband sober. And when I got sober in uh, 2009, it was, I was like 30 days sober. And, um, you know, by this time I lost everything worthwhile in my life, you know, my loved ones, my family, all, all the material things, I was pretty much gone, all gone. But, um, you know, I was in a lot of suffering, but I, I picked up a job, you know, I've, I've always been a carpenter. I was doing mm-hmm. some hardwood flooring in San Diego. It was it was um, raining that day. It was really cloudy in San Diego, and um, it was during Christmas time. And um, all of a sudden, I looked up in the sky, and it was a really it was cl- all cloudy, right? And all of a sudden, a sunlight shining forth through all the clouds, and it started to clear up in a section. And I had this inner knowing, this voice say, "You're on the right path. Everything's mm-hmm. gonna be okay." And it wasn't even in a voice. It was it was like a like a voice. It, it, was, a yeah, it, was, it was a knowing. Yeah, it was a knowing. Yeah, inner knowing. It was a knowing. I'm getting chills. Exactly. Yeah, so. That, that, that is what I'm talking about. Hmm. Because the knowings come at the same time. The chills, the moment that, and and somebody else might say, "Oh, pfft. that is your story hmm. of divine coming and helping you." And that could be somebody who, it could be somebody just getting up on this, on this video and, and just saying, wow, this is what I needed to hear for the day. Our team with divine love helps us in miraculous times if we're willing to receive it. Thank you for receiving, by the way. Thank you. And um, last question, what kind of advice would you give the 10-year-old Natasha? If you could. No matter who you are, knowing that I'm very dyslexic, didn't, couldn't read really until after high school, um, being bullied, it's time for you to stand up and then trust the process, girl. Time to trust the process. They've got it. It's not who they... <sighs> You're not ready yet, but you'll be there. You'll be there. Thank you. I really appreciate it. 
Thanks for coming on. And do you have any links, your website, anything you'd like to share with us? Any last words? Well, my website is, I just redid my website. I'm so excited. I did it myself, except for I had a little bit of help, but (laughs) very proud of myself. Um, I had a lot of help, but I did it myself. Um, Intuitiveclarifications.com. You can find me on social media, Natasha Netter IC. I'm on Facebook, um, Twitter, um, X, um, TikTok, you know, Instagram, YouTube. I have over 800 videos on my YouTube channel. Most of them are short, um, two minute, one minute videos, different ways to help. I also do a show every Wednesday at four o'clock Pacific time, and it's on different subjects. Uh, sometimes it's about grief. Sometimes it's about listening to your guides. Sometimes it's about getting through what we're getting through in the moment that we're at. Sometimes about the energy, what we're at. So, and that is, um, uh, intuitive clarifications with the Tasha podcast. You can find that on most podcast platforms. Um, yeah, I'm out there doing, I'm out there being, and I really want to support people through private sessions too, because, even though I'm out there social media, it is our personal story and those personal glitches that we get into that kind of dim our light when we deserve to be our brighter light. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate oh, you and your I'm friendship. So excited. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, this, year, with this year, we've really both um, upgraded, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, we did. And thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to end it with the Marianne Williamson quote. She says, each of us has a unique part to play in the healing of the world. And you're doing a great job. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That is my my life purpose is to be light. Thank you, to Natasha. To be light. Blessings. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. The snow we out here. No, we out here working in a major way. How to speak on it just to make a play. Any given something that we make a way. Time to level up on the day to day. No, we out here working for the greater good. Expand your mind, brighten your lens the way you should. From the stars to the galaxy to speak on spirituality. I understand for the neighborhood.